Welcome to the last of our insider trading talks for this semester. And we thought, you know, obviously we've been trying to have those revolve around this totalization experiment. And the obvious culmination of that was to have the faculty themselves hash it out, sort of talk it through in terms of what this is. You know, as you, as you know, this is something that we tried out this uh, year. And so it's a work in progress in terms of how to, you know, the, the ideal in any school is to have moments of intersection where you can have productive dialogue of course, across different forms of courses, whether they're the same kind of course like these studios or seminars and studios. We all sort of try and idealize that, and that's part of why we've tried to introduce the seminar component into the studio structure on Fridays. It's, it's this sort of ways of trying to get uh, uh, us to understand different ways of looking at, um, uh, at, at our work, and also different ways of, of getting different audiences together to, to have a conversation about something, that that will um, enhance the, the work. Um, so I see this as a, a particularly interesting experiment and one that addresses uh, a small school's answer to the NAAB's uh, comprehensive requirement. So it's, it definitely is in part a reaction to the comprehensive mandate, but is something that um, we think can take that and actually move it in what we think is a stronger pedagogical direction. But this is an opportunity to sort of see three quarters of the way through the semester sort of take stock of where it's at, um, some of the, the positive aspects of how it's worked out, some things that might be uh, fine-tuned for, for future semesters of this. We do see this as something that will continue for the next few years. Um, uh, as I've noted, we have um, a, an alum who, have, who has stepped up to the plate to actually support this endeavor, supporting the uh, funding of the New York trip as well as the consultants from New York coming here. Um, uh, in, in future years even more intensively than they've been able to so far. So the success of this experiment has led us to be able to um, build on that and, and uh, elaborate it. So I get to uh, get off the table and hand the microphone over to Troy, who can then um, essentially lead this, this band of merry fellows. So. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Um, <clears throat> As Sarah said, uh, this has been, um, in a way, uh, an experiment uh, this semester in uh, formulating, uh, at a very basic level, uh, a new way to teach um, what has previously been called comprehensive design. But um, when we were uh, initially all asked to do it, I think um, there was a, a collective ambition, um, uh, uh, partly um, from the directive of Sarah and partly from a kind of collective conversation that we would uh, teach this uh, studio with um, an ambition that would be an advanced studio that would somehow deal with the uh, limits of architecture um, in a much more uh, uh, advanced and complete way, which is what, where we get the notion of totalization. So we seem to immediately understand that ambition, as we all consider ourselves practitioners, that's the thing that ties us together, that are seduced by the potential breadth of issues, methods, and situations that architecture has a stake in. At the same time, that we have, through experience, we become aware of the demands placed on architecture as de is developed completely and uh, from initial diagrams, positions, or intuitions into built projects deployed in the world um, and the responsibilities that go with that effort. We felt, however, that those demands, responsibilities, um, and uh, limits for us had become productive limits, allowing us to hone, refine, and sometimes uh, surprisingly redefine our conceptions regarding the projects and the situations we were attempting to respond to with those projects. So there, we came from very, these very disparate um, practice backgrounds, which is uh, one thing we think is interesting about the studio. Um, and we each tried to figure out um, what we could agree on initially um, in order to structure a kind of overall project for the studio uh, and for the coordination between the studios. I would say um, the three things we did agree on, um, the first one was um, we agreed in a way ideologically um, and that we agreed that there would be a um, necessary in order to teach the material we wanted to teach was a broad engagement with um, practice and an uh, engagement broadly with practice and concepts and ideologies for the project. So the idea of the total project was a project that considers the broadest set of concerns that bear 
on the conception and the production of architecture from cultural, material, technical. And from these concerns, we wanted to formulate a clear conceptual position supported by a precise architectural statement. And we understood through our experience and practice that that's what's required um, to, to bring a project through to a kind of, in a kind of complete way, in a kind of total way, um, in dealing with consultants and dealing with uh, uh, various um, issues that run through the discipline. Um, we agreed methodologically that we were going to um, uh, collaborate with these consultants and basically bring our ideas. If, there's, if we have ideas that we're developing here around urbanism, around architecture, around building here locally in Houston, we were going to um, bring in a kind of uh, know-how that's a kind of global know-how from New York and from um, other places to uh, propel and accelerate the ideas of the studio and make it a true uh, research project embedded um, uh, within the uh, concept of the studio. So we brought in, uh, as Sarah mentioned, Matt Oppenheimer, Mark Malik Shahi, and Mark Simmons. Um, and we visited their offices in New York and, and increased the collab collaboration that way. And lastly, um, we agreed on a kind of structure pedagogically that um, through the collaboration and co uh, coordination amongst ourselves, um, we would create a kind of loose framework where, in, in a way, through a kind of exquisite corpse method, method um, by structuring the um, complete uh, project of architecture, we would somehow uh, greatly defined, uh, or more greatly defined collectively, a larger uh, body of architecture than we were able to do in the course of um, one discrete studio. Um, and so we did that through uh, uh, dividing the studios into uh, Will Kennedy's studio, which is um, a framework or numbers. Uh, and Will, Will takes numbers as <clears throat> focusing on understanding of how market forces um, affect design processes. The program is a response to market demand, financing, and technology. These three factors drive numbers. Numbers are measured in combinations, quantities, qualities, time, economics, and finances. Uh, for Will, numbers drive architecture. Um, groundwork uh, typologies. Um, uh, for Mark Womble, uh, in teaching groundwork typologies, he wanted to explore the kind of um, <clears throat> some basic typologies around the void uh, in relation to uh, the capacity of the void to organize groups of building along um, Bissonette Street in Houston. Um, for my studio, Formwork Light Skins, the object of the studio was to identify the uh, appropriate organizational and urban potentials of two um, building skin paradigms, the representational facade and the high performance building envelope. Um, and lastly, for Doug Oliver's studio, um, Softwork or Wet Systems, um, he tried to study the architectural um, potential of giving form to water and air in various transformational states. And <clears throat> so these uh, four studios taken together we imagine could both articulate different possible responses to um, uh, and different architectural agendas uh, in relation to the kind of larger body of architecture, um, as well uh, allow us to collectively describe something that we couldn't each individually explore in the individual studios. So lastly, <clears throat> I want to talk a bit about our response to the notion of comprehensive um, and how our studio, in, in a way, in this advanced way, is trying to position <clears throat> the projects as a um, an expansion or uh, really a total reformulization of the notion of comprehensive. So <clears throat> if comprehensive uh, starts with this definition, uh, the ability to produce a comprehensive architectural project based on a building program and site that includes development of program spaces, demonstrating an understanding of structural environmental systems, building envelope systems, life safety provisions, wall sections, and building assemblies, uh, and the principles of sustainability. And we see all these as the um, <clears throat> potential demands and limitations on architecture that are often taught as a kind of um, uh, base competency or almost architectural training in ar architecture schools. And we saw these as um, uh, things to potentially uh, explore to propel the conceptual investigations further. And <clears throat> so for me, I want to tell a brief anecdote that um, I've told my students before that sort of sums up our attitudes to how we deal with these limitations. Um, I went to architecture school uh, as an undergraduate in a very rural location um, uh, in the woods of uh, Western Virginia. And I had a friend there that, um, well, I won't really call him a friend, but he was a kind of acquaintance, really, um, that uh, was more, I would say, into the more into the recreational aspects of uh, college than the educational aspects. Um, but he somehow always, he, uh, he was a bad influence on me, but somehow I remember this one story from him. Uh, where when he did show up in the studio and he'd be gone for a while, I'd say, where are you? And he'd say, well, I was up driving in the woods around Smith Mountain Lake, which is, um, you know, there are no roads around Smith Mountain Lake. And so I'd say, you drive a Camaro, Garrick. I don't understand <laughs> how it is that you're driving up in the woods around Smith Mountain Lake. He just had a, like a 1987 uh, uh, Chevy Camaro, I guess. And uh, he'd say, well, yeah, you know, 
there's a lot of places I can't go with my Camaro. You know, I, I drive around, but I drive in the woods in the Camaro Camaro all the time. And there's a lot of places you can't go, but there's a lot of places you can go. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> basically, this image of the, 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 the limitations of the Camaro and, and the woods and what Garrick was able to do with the Camaro, I think is in a way sums up uh, an attempt to sum up our attitude about the kind of limitations that are placed in the studio and actually look at them as, um, uh, as things that propel our work and not things that constrain or, or, or try to limit our work. Um, so with that, um, we're going to do a quick format uh, uh, here today to try to leave time for conversation. Um, what we attempted to do is, one thing uh, I should mention for those of you that are not involved in the studio, how many people here are in the studio? Okay, so a good number. So what we wanted to attempt to do especially given that this is the first time we're teaching together and trying to position our work in relation to each other, is we've um, had about six opportunities, six to eight opportunities, depending on how you formulate it, to um, collaborate across studios in the semester and present our work um, to each other. Uh, we've all seen the work of, um, all the studios have seen the work of the other studios. Um, a lot of the school has seen the work of our studios. Um, and so what we, we're gonna attempt to try to do is uh, take this kind of ambition that I've laid out um, in the introduction and connect it to um, some very discreet, very simple um, examples in our practices, um, in our experience and practice that we think um, gives credence or gives um, uh, basically the kind of imperative to teach the studio the way we're teaching it and that it's going to deal with this broad set of issues and not necessarily um, uh, narrowly focused on competency. So in doing that we'll <clears throat> go through the kind of sequence of the uh, other people up here uh, and starting with Will <clears throat> and we'll um, move through each, each person's going to present a very um, uh, discreet story about their practice. Okay, Will? <clears throat> uh, my comments today, uh, can you hear me? No, no. Hello? Yeah. <clears throat> no. no. My comments today are an attempt to uh, make a connection between my teaching and my practice. In architectural practice, <clears throat> Issues of design are dominated by the designer's search for solutions to client's project requirements within three major elements of architectural design, context, program, and technology. Context is the when and the where, program is the what, and technology is the how. <coughs> my, studio, uh, my studio this semester focuses on under <coughs> understanding how market forces affect design processes. Theory of the why in this case relates to the fact that the majority of the country's urban form is composed of privately constructed facilities, most using market-driven processes. Overlapping and connecting these three elements in the role of collaboration, it is a role of collaboration, and uh, our studio uh, works with uh, clients, landscape architects, engineers, retail and housing experts, consultants, and contractors in other words, it, 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 it has, it's as is the case in the real world. Uh, design processes in most studios around the country tend to stress the individual search, individual student search for a unique form using digital modeling as the working method. Form is only one aspect of architecture. To me, shape is irrelevant in architecture. Design in, in, in both my design studios and practice usually starts with the following processes. Problem statement and definition, program, then alternative functional relationship diagrams, then ordering systems and diagrams, and uh, then structural and mechanical system layouts, then sections, and then, uh, then I begin massive studies. Sometimes these procedures are implemented in reverse or in random arrangements, uh, depending upon when, where, and whether good and appropriate ideas occur. In RSA studios, in my practice, the design process starts with a client and a site. It is actually easier to get a real client involved in the teaching of a studio at, at RSA than it is to get a client for a real job. <laughs> Mies van der Rohe, when asked what were the most important things in architecture, supposedly said, number one, get a job. Number two, get a job. And number three, get a job. And to get a job, uh, and, 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 I mean a project, not to be confused with employment, a young architect must have... They are linked. 
<laughs> and the young architect was half demonstrable, don't work. Uh, this is clearly a chicken and egg dilemma. <clears throat> the two projects that I will show today were selected with the thought that a brief explanation of how these jobs happened and how they connect teaching and practice might be helpful to our students and uh, our young faculty. My, my, my teaching pedagogy part, <coughs> my teaching pedagogy mirrors my experience in practice. I would describe my type of practice as an experimental practice. The two frames I will show today are examples of connections between experiments in teaching and practice. The first project succeeded because of my early studio work on single family housing uh, design, as, as, uh, <coughs> single, excuse me, single family housing design, especially in the late 1960s, <coughs> team teaching with Anderson Todd. These studios pre pre projects involved highly constrained designs of modest courtyard houses uh, or a small piano studio where students were challenged to find ideas of integrating space, structure, and materials. An idea, another idea of research in RSA studios that connected to practice focused on how the influence of the automobile dominated, I'm sorry, how the influence of the automobile could be turned into a positive uh, in, instead of the uh, negative uh, outcomes prevalent in automobile-oriented, uh, dominated Houston. <clears throat> in my RSA studios of practice, a hypothesis begins with the assumption that the first thing one must solve is the automobile access and pay the parking. Get that right and everything else comes easy. On the other hand, if you accommodate the car with a conventional concept and customary layout, the final result will end up being conventional. It's even worse trying to add uh, the, the solutions to a scheme after your building is designed. <coughs> um, <coughs> there's a title here that says, I made it into the big leagues, but struck out on my first time at bat. I made it in the big, into the big leagues in 1970, eight years after graduating from GSD, and six years after starting my teaching at Rice. At least I thought so. Uh, Jack Mitchell, the former dean here, and I uh, had a firm uh, or, uh, located downtown, and we were interviewed by Gerald Hines, thank you, uh, Gerald Hines, in 1970 for uh, a design of, a, of, of his development company's first residential development, which was a 250 dwelling unit uh, condo project in West Houston. Meeting with Mr. Hines in his plush office, we showed him numerous planning reports that we had completed for. Uh, uh, well-known developers uh, around Texas and nationally even. Uh, he followed this presentation with, uh, with great interest. Then Hines asked if he could look at slides of our built housing. Uh, I responded that we hadn't built anything yet. Uh, then Hines asked, uh, then he looked at his watch and he, uh, he, he said uh, to his residential division CEO, uh, I have to leave now. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, then he scurried out of the room. I felt like I'd struck out, and I knew that I'd have to double my effort to get back in the major leagues again. The, the same dilemma that I mentioned earlier occurred. In, in other words, uh, an architect must have something built in order to get his first job. Um, to do that, I would, have to, I would have to be my own client, regardless of the fact that I didn't have any money to build anything. WTCH1, uh, which is the slide up above, was an experiment that attempted to minimize and simplify the amount of exterior envelope within a maximum cubic space, in other words, a cube. This design was built in 1972 for half the cost of a typical customer house of the time. Uh, it was $13 a square foot versus $25 a square foot. Another idea uh, that I used was to place the house on top of, a, uh, of an open garage with an alley at the rear, this is over in Southampton, uh, with uh, Elliot in the rear, uh, this move minimized the impact of the car on the, uh, on the land and also <clears throat> views from the two sides of the house were down block-long tree-filled vistas as opposed to looking at your neighbor's house 10 feet away on each side. This move also created a large play yard for our young children in the front of the house. The house's expression was <clears throat> an integration of ideas that arrived from my education <clears throat> A Mesian floor plan, in fact, the floor plan of the second floor is, is, a, is a replica of uh, Anderson Todd's first house of Shadowlong Circle. It's a much smaller version of it. Uh, 
Yeah. The, uh, the so the, 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 the plan was really a Mise en Floor plan, but the the uh, section was a carbu section because it had a piano noble and a roof terrace on the fourth level. And uh, a restrained exterior skin reminiscent of the work of William Worcester. This was the beginning of a 10 year collaboration with Anderson Todd, a practice we defined as top quality, bottom dollar architecture. <laughs> Exemplified by our design in 1973 for the Proxy House. <coughs> After my house was completed, as a CEO and both of the VPs were amongst the, the first to see the house. They walked through the house, clipboard in hand, making a note of the various details. In a very short time, in a very short time, they hired a, a firm to uh, uh, rework Hans's second 250 dwelling unit project that had been designed by a California architect who had never worked with Houston type air conditioning. Uh, he had assumed that ducts could be jammed in between two by 10 rock roof joints. And so my job was to revise the design of the partly constructed complex to accommodate the air conditioning supply ducts and return air systems. In 1974, uh, WTCA was awarded the commission to design the a third 250 dwelling unit townhouse project by Hanges Company. Uh, there's a title here, it says, Hit a Home Run. Uh, Lovett Square uh, involved a client who was the father of a former student, uh, then an employee in my practice. Uh, Sarah, this is Richard Beard. You mentioned him a minute ago. This, this developer called me one afternoon in 1976 and asked me to help him figure out what he should build on a 250 by 250 foot midtown block. He was a single family builder uh, who had, had no experience in multifamily and uh, he had joined forces with a banker named Lovett Baker. Where do you think he went to school? Uh, to these guys purchased two vacant blocks in midtown. <coughs> Two days, later, two days later, I met with uh, Mr. Peter and explained the three schemes I had developed. Uh, one was for 24 townhouses, one was for 36 condos, and one was for 48 apartments. After reviewing the schemes and their numbers, uh, and I mean both uh, physical numbers of, of square footage, but also I did some pro forma work on, on uh, return expected. After reviewing these, I, I recommended the 36 condos because it was the only scheme that radically treated the automobile in the sense that the automobiles are, 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 on a, are covered, they're on the ground, but they are in two, two trays of parking with a, a precast uh, garage over that. And then the houses that are two story townhouses are stacked, one on the ground above the garage, and then a three story one is turned sideways and run parallel to the, to the uh, north south streets. <coughs> You know, six, uh, six clusters of six condos are arranged along an axis. Each cluster of six condos is arranged around a small courtyard. In section two and three story units are stacked to create a hillside effect and add the parking garage. Interest rates exploded to 18% as the construction of Lovett Square was uh, completed. My firm's design for the second block that, I, that, that was named Baker Square was uh, canceled. Over the years, Research and exploration in design studios continue to make connections to my work um, of, of the work of my experimental practice. And I added this note, I calculated um, just a minute ago that from 1964 to 1976, uh, 10 of those years, I know I did multifamily housing, the other two, uh, one of them was picking up on Chuck Thompson's course uh, in, uh, in uh, I think it was February 15th of 1964 when Chuck had to go to Chile on a big Ford Foundation grant. But anyway, these, in those 10 years, if you assume 10 years at, at 10 to at two studios per year, that's 20 studios times uh, 10 to 12 students, we're well, talking about a couple of hundred schemes. I counted the alternatives that I had gone through, so I, I could design three schemes in two days because of all this experience I had working with students. And, uh, the last 15 years I've been working in multifamily, uh, I'm sorry, mixed, mixed use projects, mostly transitory on Main Street, where we now own two blocks and uh, if politics and economics keep, keep improving, I think I'll be able to show that my practice is 
benefiting from, from the last 15 years of teaching. Thank you very much. You forgot the church, Bill. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to quickly um, try to move through uh, two examples um, in my recent practice. Um, my most recent practice experience um, beyond the uh, small practice I'm building up in that um, moment Will's referred to as the get a job, get a job, get a job moment um, has been uh, working on um, Nielsen Hall in OMA in uh, New York. And uh, uh, Matt Oppenheimer came and discussed this issue of uh, a kind of trust that we actually worked on together uh, in the development of um, that project, and I wanted to quickly tell the story of that trust from um, the perspective of uh, those of us in the uh, OMA office that were um, working on the project at the time. So the problem, um, uh, this is basically the story of the hybrid trust. Um, the project of <clears throat> Milstein Hall, as um, some of you know that have seen it, is, uh, was about creating a kind of open plate connector, a kind of museum box that could connect the uh, two adjacent buildings of uh, Sibley and Rand Hall in order to keep it as open as possible. Um, it was initially conceived to be portal frames uh, underneath the project as it spanned over the adjacent uh, University Avenue towards the foundry. Um, through various uh, um, uh, legal, um, uh, public relations, um, internal uh, conflicts within the, um, can you guys all hear me? Internal conflicts um, uh, uh, within the administration uh, and, and some safety concerns as well for block sight lines, it was decided at um, almost 60% uh, CDs that the project uh, could no longer be uh, simply supported uh, structure, that it would, um, it would need to be uh, cantilevered. Um, and so <clears throat> that posed a number of problems for us as the architects, um, and it became not merely a problem of uh, optimization of the structure, which in a way we probably wish it was, because um, uh, it, it, would re it would render the kind of cheapest possible solution, um, but there were several other factors that ran through, uh, including the connectivity across the plate. So you can see um, these are the two, um, two ini very initial uh, early, op early options that we considered. Um, the one was looking at the Ver Verandel Truss, which um, left the plate as open as possible, which was the, clearly the um, uh, initial conception that you could reorganize studios and reorganize um, uh, uh, the school and the way things are taught uh, uh, as, thing as ideas evolved over time or the kind of the cheapest version, which was the kind of um, uh, conventional uh, diagonals. Um, both of them had problems um, in that even the uh, Verandel truss was very heavy, as you can see. Can, I, can you guys see this by point or no? Okay, uh, the, uh, the Verandel truss, uh, which is very heavy uh, in the end, um, and that weight at the time um, uh, in the boom was uh, driving costs, costs very high. Um, and, and as well, the cross brace method you can see in the red um, actually ended up more than, even though they were lighter uh, physically, ended up blocking the circulation uh, quite a lot more than we expected. And we uh, even experimented with you know, many, many options, including looking at um, you know, ways that would kind of um, be a, a simple hybrid, um, where you'd have a kind of open truss and certain parts would operate in bending and certain parts um, uh, would operate uh, uh, diagonally. Um, at, at one point, it was actually a, a kind of um, a very decisive moment. Um, uh, there was a, a meeting in which we realized, uh, looking at the, the kind of programmatic distribution across the plate that you can see below, and looking at the moment diagrams that were being produced by the engineers, and uh, in kind of a moment of crisis, um, we realized that the places where we needed the most openness, where there were stairs, where there were access to the auditorium, where there were elevators, where there's actually the kind of most circulation between the two buildings, um, had the least amount of stress uh, uh, on it in the beam, and the places that we could imagine being slightly more segmented, like the studio spaces, um, actually uh, ha were the places where there were more stress and so would require uh, something to be more efficient, would require something to, so closer to the conventional truss. So we ended up with um, uh, this, this solution that was the, uh, we called the hybrid truss, um, which Nat showed. Um, and essentially not as a kind of uh, idealized structure that, um, that papers over these kind of differences and these kind of conflicts and a kind of um, simple optimization of uh, structure and form, but actually uh, it required a kind of a negotiation or uh, it really the kind of role of the architect and architecture to somehow synthesize these um, uh, disparate forces of, uh, you know, from cane protection <laughs> for, the ADA, for the ADA to, um, uh, you know, issues of structure to issues of circulation um, and also just to issues of uh, legibility along the facade. Um, which you can see uh, here. So now this is the, the new span uh, over the road. Um, and actually, we were able to uh, create a, a back span 
that was actually much cheaper on the other side, even though it technically didn't need to cantilever, um, uh, could cantilever and create some efficiency uh, in the counterbalance uh, for the part over the road. And so from the main view of the campus, you actually see no columns, and the building would, would um, extend uh, in both directions because the columns are sort of hidden behind RAM. And you can see the, um, the structure as you approach it from university now and the gradation from the um, more normative uh, Verandel type structure to the kind of cross brace structure. And then here's the steel being installed. So, and then the second story I'm going to tell even faster um, because I'm trying to leave time for uh, conversation and really just um, position some uh, re recent experience. Um, and so, actually, one of the last things that uh, I worked on uh, as I left OMA um, was a sales office for this project at um, 23 East 22nd Street, um, which some of you may or may not know, but um, basically the, the building uh, switches from one side of the core to the other <laughs> and cantilevers over an adjacent building in order to peek around. Uh, the adjacent building um, and, and look at a, a view of the park, essentially. Um, the, the sales office had happened very fast. It was a kind of um, boom moment. Um, and so, um, and, but, so we actually were making a sales office before any of the interiors were designed, um, which is kind of a, a, a weird proposition. And it, it sort of like stumped us for a while. And it had to happen all basically about in the time span that you guys uh, take a studio from the time we were thinking about this until the time you could start selling units inside this office. So actually, this is Jake Forrester, who uh, worked quite a lot on the project, um, uh, an intern uh, just out of his third year of school. Um, basically, um, we had been producing all these models of the project, and we realized the project itself had a form um, that could potentially uh, um, uh, take on the, uh, the demands of, uh, of a sales office, and partially inspired maybe by the, uh, the famous cover of Delirious New York with the um, buildings lounging in, in, in the bed. We realized that a quarter inch scale Actually, this is not one quarter inch, one quarter scale model of the whole project could fit inside the Soho storefront. We also weren't allowed to touch the storefront, which is a kind of another limitation. And so uh, we inserted the, um, the model in the, in the project and we realized you would get these, you know, uh, quite amazing spaces to, um, to, to sell units in. Um, the problem was it had to happen very quickly. So pretty much the whole project is um, uh, made out of uh, um, uh, Lexan or... Um, uh, polycarbonate um, uh, sheet, uh, the kind of vinyl material that you um, see on buses, uh, and simple T8 lighting fixtures, which uh, uh, you see all, all over the university and um, uh, in studios and, and other places. So with T8 lighting fixtures, with metal studs, uh, with polycarbonate and with uh, vinyl signage, well, we, we moved ahead, um, uh, integrating all, you know, figuring out the integration of the services, um, uh, the thing actually became a kind of plenum to distribute air. The thing became a, its own light. We didn't need to install lights because the lights were going to be embedded in the project. And we really wanted to conceive of the project as though you were entering uh, in, the, um, in the model from the bottom and moving up to the project. So uh, this is the kind of entry, and you can see you're moving into the model now. Uh, you can see even as you move in, we have uh, the uh, pattern of the, the section of the first three floors. We're actually on the floor as you're, as you're moving across through the project. Um, and uh, you can see here, this is the, the project um, with the kind of curation of the kind of models inside that we were uh, able to sell them. Um, and then uh, you know, looking back towards, towards the entry, now you're in the, basically the penthouse uh, looking down through the project. Um, and then the simple way we, we actually, just, I just showed this slide to illustrate the simple way which it was constructed with these are simple house jacks that we essentially chromed to, um, to uh, support the, the platforms. And then it produced a kind of gallery space um, on the inside. And so I wanted to show these two uh, projects as a kind of contrast, one that has a very long time scale and quite a lot of um, uh, 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 technical innovation and a, a lot of kind of uh, disciplinary like rigor involved in, in sorting through all the details and the openings and some of the things that I, I didn't even get to talk about in kind of integration of the trust and something that could happen very quickly and through uh, with very simple materials, things that are you know, even available to us um, you know, here in studio and almost in the time span of the studio, something that could be um, executed very quickly um, from the kind of initial um, uh, spark of an idea or kind of inspiration through uh, 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 following the kind of parameters uh, uh, logically that way. So now we're going to move on to Doug. Um, Doug Oliver. I'll slide it over. Um. As Troy said, uh, the project in our studio this semester is an auditorium. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's actually located on a half city block in downtown Houston. So uh, programmatically, it's, a, it's about urban swimming because it's uh, in the city and perhaps the most dense place that you can find in Houston. 
Um, and the thought behind doing that was a couple things. One is, is that the site is constrained. Uh, and usually when you look at, at uh, the way in which comprehensive studios play themselves out, it's really starting uh, with uh, a, a general kind of approach to architecture and then getting closer and closer to the systems where mechanical structure and enclosure begin to become more and more finite and defined as you go. I purposely set it up that it would uh, problematize and bring to the foreground both the structure and the mechanical portions of it. Uh, the program for the natatorium is basically three large pools or swimming areas, some chlorinated, some having salt water. Basically, they are hot, moist spaces. And the mechanical part, I asked the students actually not to rely heavily on air conditioning. I said, what is it we could do with the disposition of each of these sort of volumes with envelope and actually the shape of the building to actually facilitate uh, natural moments of convection and actually uh, force the wind to do a lot of work for us. The structural part, obviously, is we have three swimming pools that will not align cleanly and you have to stack them vertically. So it obviously problematizes in foreground structure as well. Um, and I will say that, that uh, there is a tie here, I think, to practice for me for some issues that obsess is too strong a word, but at least have been kind of rattling around, and if not the subject, at least subtext for several uh, projects. And what I'm going to show you today are, <clears throat> excuse me, two projects that deal with the issue of building shape and wind and the purpose of a part of that. And what I'm interested in is when you begin to get to these extreme conditions like the structure in the natatorium, uh, how do you handle that? The, the problems of actually just doing that. Same with the idea of, of actually the shape of the building beginning to actually interact and alter uh, the weather of the building. Uh, and um, there are always moments of disconnect between that and the original architectural idea. And it's that kind of slipperiness between those two, which is really what we're looking at this semester. The first project deals with um, really uh, vernacular uh, notions of cooling. It is uh, a, a competition, a, a design build competition that we were asked to enter about a year and a half ago uh, with a contractor who had done quite a bit of work uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. And it was to develop uh, eight prototypical uh, primary schools. Uh, there were six basic typologies, uh, but there were going to be eight of them. They were going to build these as um, basically as a, as a kind of new paradigm for, for uh, schools in Trinidad and Tobago. And what you see in front of you are a series of kind of diagrams. There was a huge range in terms of the number of students, the programs. Oh, sorry, was that not a... Yeah, not a... <laughs> I'm not sorry. a math. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. So, so what you see is the... Uh, 2011 damn minimalist project. <laughs> yeah, it was very minimalist. That's, there wasn't a lot of budget. So. <laughs> so what you see is the kind of range of the programmatic mix and all that uh, from, you know, a, a very few students to, uh, you know, a large... And, and what made this a little bit kind of counterintuitive is that there was an extraordinary range, not only in the size of the buildings, but actually the context. Some were very urban, some were rural, some were on hills, some were not. So uh, each of these is, is actually, even though prototypical, is actually very specific to the site conditions, both climatic, but also the topography and where it sits and all of that. It had to be done quickly, it had to be done cheaply, and it had to utilize, it had to be unair conditioned. Uh, the Republic of uh, Trinidad and Tobago, as you know, is in the Caribbean, so there's a constant kind of breeze, but it's a hot, moist climate. So there are parallels to, uh, to Houston. Uh, the, we just don't have a beautiful blue water. Uh, and I'm showing you six of the, of the eight uh, schemes here, and I'll go through a couple in detail just to kind of show you the kind of range. Um, in, each of the, in each of these sort of situations, whatever the context, we try to actually frame a view of it. Uh, we try to actually uh, use the shape to, uh, to uh, force air through the building. There was a requirement for an outdoor classroom space. Uh, screening and natural ventilation is important, so you see different notions of, of, uh, <clears throat> of louvering and just grill work and things like that. Uh, the materials are basically concrete, masonry block, and not much more. Um, and I'll go through a, cu a couple of them here. This is one of the small ones uh, that you see. Uh, and you can see how the roof begins to kind of peel away uh, in the direction that will allow wind to kind of come through. So, I'll get this up to the end of the view. So you can see here again where you have the kind of uh, very simple kind of profile. It's lifted off the ground, again, to facilitate air movement. Uh, the stair that kind of falls through, 
falls out of the front of the building is actually intended to be that outdoor classroom space. Uh, there is a view to the, to the landscape beyond, which is framed by the roof. And again, the shape of the roof uh, collects water and it begins to allow the heat to sort of rise and winds to kind of come through and begin to kind of evacuate, uh, evacuate that. Um, and then a second one, which is just in a di completely different context, you can see where it has a strange condition with a retaining wall and kind of hillside here. Same sort of thing, very sort of simple material palette. Each of these, again, beginning to kind of maximize uh, and take advantage of, uh, of really uh, the climate. Each trying to keep a, uh, uh, a kind of singular space, which is outside, is kind of part of that. The next project really deals with some of the same issues. And this is a project that we were awarded about the time that the studio was starting. Um, and this is actually, takes the same kind of principles actually that are involved in, in, in the kind of um, Trinidad and Tobago schools and takes it in a much more serious, much more high tech way for lack of a better word. Uh, this is a new IT building for IT, IT department and media center for Santa Monica College. Uh, it sits uh, on the, 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 the southern edge or southeastern, excuse me, southwestern side of the, uh, of the campus. Most of the larger, newer buildings are at the far end. So there was a desire, even though this building was only about 18,000 square feet, to begin to anchor and give an architectural presence for that edge of campus. Um, and to be, pull the IT department out of the kind of bowels of most schools where it's hidden from out of sight and actually make this, the, 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 a small building appear larger and to do more work architecturally than, than you would normally expect. Um, it utilized about 6,000 square feet of renovation within the existing library building, which is this giant concrete behemoth that you see right here. So the site is actually on the, on the edge there. Um, so anyway, it was a very complex kind of project and what I'm showing you is really the, the preliminary sort of sketches that we did, that we were, that we did to, uh, to be awarded the project. Uh, and it's in, it's in schematic design right now and going forward. Um, because this building, the building that it attaches to, is really a kind of brutalist, uh, massive building of concrete, um, that we decided that we would have to use concrete in some sort of meaningful way. What we did, instead of attaching to the building, what you see on the left, that small one-story piece is the actual library piece itself, was to pull the building, the new building away, align it against the street in a very simple, straightforward way, creating a kind of light well or courtyard space between those two buildings, which will allow us a natural kind of breezeway and then have a connector back to it. Um, it's mostly glazed uh, with a frit, which is intended to uh, keep glare off the computer screens, but essentially highly transparent. Uh, and then this kind of folded uh, concrete roof that goes over the entire building to do a couple of things. One, to give us some sunscreening, all the glass that we just, you know, uh, put on the exterior to collect rainwater and to also create a kind of pinch pointer of venturi effect at the edge between the actual roof of the building and this plane which is actually uh, free freestanding, doesn't touch it. And that choke point is where we had uh, suggested placing an array of small wind turbines. Santa Monica College is very interested, they're putting PVs all over everything in sort of sustainable strategies and the actual roof, the building shaping to actually allow um, wind generated power or something was really uh, of interest to them and one of the reasons why we were awarded the project. <clears throat> so, in, uh, so the roof here you see uh, is, is actually beginning, this is the first kind of study is beginning to look at the dominant wind direction. Los Angeles is not particularly good for wind because of the hills and everything else. Santa Monica because of its proximity to the Pacific actually is. So the short end of the building uh, faces the ocean and we were going to use that. So again, the roof begins to sunshade, uh, collect water, and create kind of a, a foil uh, to channel the, the air through. And then this is what you see uh, from the, uh, the main public space and the kind of short end of the building here. So you have all the media studies parts on the lower floor. You have the IT department up. You have this piece which, which is just over between that gap between the existing building and the new building, which is the entry point. And in this view here, you see the other end of the building, and this is actually where the roof comes back and actually begins to kind of collect the wind and begin to kind of compress it and accelerate it towards the, uh, the front of the building out through the courtyard space. 
Again, you can see how it begins to kind of uh, turn down on the uh, southwestern side to provide some sunscreening as well. This is a resultant uh, courtyard space or light rail. The, the piece on the left is actually reglazing of the existing uh, building itself, and this is actually a natural pathway right now uh, for students to move back and forth. Uh, but it, it allows light and wind, and frankly creates uh, what we think is a, a nice, small, but uh, important public space uh, uh, on the campus at this point, which doesn't exist. And then ultimately you can see the kind of full roof, and this is Pearl Street, which is that major edge of campus. So again, the, the building form is actually trying to purposely manipulate uh, or exploit climatic conditions, but also there's a notion here of actually using the form not only to do that, but to actually make the building appear larger to actually uh, deal with more of the kind of larger campus things. illustrate some of the issues that we've encountered um, uh, sort of as a, as a group um, in the this is a project I think it's a site that will look familiar to some of you uh, those of you who took my studio last semester um, I wanted to show a project that was not built. One of our, um, one of the projects we did recently. Um, uh, in fact, it was exactly a year ago, uh, pretty much that we uh, presented it. Um, it's the same project that I gave my studio um, in the fall of, of 2009. Uh, it's for a, uh, a, a, um, a conservation foundation located in Hempstead, Texas. Um, it's actually an extension to a, a garden that has been under construction since 1970. Uh, it's called Pecker Wood Garden. Don't ask me about the name. Um, but it uh, it's was originally built uh, or started in 1970 by a, um, a professor at Texas A&M University. This is the site. Um, it's uh, 19 acres. Um, uh, every plant, every square foot of the ground uh, was developed, planted, uh, cultivated, propagated by um, by the, uh, the man who owns the property. The studio last semester was given the task of actually combining a new piece of property with the original piece of property, which you can see in this small diagram here um, in the upper left board. Uh, the upper portion uh, is the original plot and the lower portion is the new plot. It doubles the size of the, of the original garden. So you can imagine a garden that's been under construction, which means is that there are plants that have been growing for 40 years. Um, the idea of expanding that uh, in any realistic or sort of meaningful way was quite a daunting task. It included both the prospect of, of how we would build in the short term, uh, as well as the prospect of how we lay a groundwork for um, a garden to grow in the long term. I have two sets of boards here. This is an excerpt from a presentation that we made to the uh, Conservation Foundation. Um, this is the first uh, set of boards. This is, I think, uh, there were, I guess, 16 boards uh, all together. I'm showing you eight. This is the second set of boards. I see these boards as very different kinds of boards. Um, they show very different uh, sets of information. And I think it's relevant to the idea of totalization in the sense that uh, we operate, we're, I think our ambitions are to operate simultaneously on two levels. I would argue that the first set of boards represent uh, what I'll call a, a set of proclamations, um, which is to say that we make a series of suggestions um, about, let's say, the analysis of the site, um, the conditions of the program, the ambitions of the institution, um, the, the 
some idea of perhaps um, some of the types of buildings that we have available to us, notions about the economy uh, of the project, et cetera, and put forward these proclamations based largely upon experience. Um, there may be aspects of the projects that we have looked into in, to some detail, but to a large extent, these are proclamations that we project forward in a fairly abstract way. Um, so, for example, uh, the board on the upper left shows some uh, ideas about the types of analyses we went through, shows the ideas of the topography taken from GIS maps, the extent to which the site, which uh, you may not realize slopes a large extent, to a large extent, does in fact have a lot of topography. Um, the board on the upper right begins to show uh, some of the initial schemes that we went through um, with the foundation showing different configurations of program and really what the program meant as it was reconfigured. Um, and that it would probably, you know, to our best, to the best of our ability, imagining the way these different configurations would in fact um, produce a very different effect in the long run, but all guesswork through these proclamations. Um, this is a sort of a diagram on the upper right hand side of the, the scheme that was selected. On the lower left hand side is a site plan showing that scheme. Um, Perhaps one of the, the more significant um, ideas that we presented was the notion that if you, if you look at the site um, in isolation, there are certain things that would suggest an orientation and massing of the project and distribution of the program, um, let's say in accordance with either its alignment with the street or alignments with, with other local physical conditions like existing buildings or, or physical features like uh, um, detention tanks. But as you zoom out, you find, of course, that there's a larger landscape in play, and this line here on this diagram begins to show that the, the canal that the site slopes into, or let's say the, 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 um, the, the creek that it flows into, does in fact follow a very different line. The, the larger landscape suggests a very different orientation for the buildings. If you align that building with some notions of drainage, which was very important in this rural site, um, not only for the purposes of just managing stormwater, but also finding opportunities for propagating new plants um, and, and species of trees by harvesting that water, capturing it, and making use of it to, to uh, inform the landscape. And then some initial ideas about the image of the project, which are shown on the lower right-hand side, uh, largely having to do with the, the idea of using a weathered um, steel uh, rain screen and allowing the building to recede into the landscape so that the planting uh, comes to the foreground. Now this set of boards, though, I think represents something uh, very different, which is to say um, once the, the, the initial set of discussions and decisions were made, we began to switch uh, into a very different mode of investigation, a very different way of designing. And I would characterize these sets of boards as representing um, examinations. So the idea that once a series of, of claims are made, and there is a set of agreements between our design team, our experts, and the, the client, um, which of course are very useful for establishing a kind of a level ground, uh, uh, let's say um, uh, an area where the conversation can be free uh, between the different participants in the process. We moved into an examination mode, which is to say uh, what really happens uh, with uh, a, a rain screen? How does it work? What happens when, because, I, and I think that uh, what we also find in the examination phase is that some of the assumptions that we were making in the first set of uh, design moves are contradictory with one another. They run at odds with one another. In this case, the long facade of the building was oriented to the east and the west um, in order to accommodate the flow of water across the site. And the flow of water across the site was decided to be a, a, a more important and critical category than the broader orientation uh, of the east and west facades to the sun. So that precipitated, <clears throat> precipitated the discussion about the rain screen. Keep in mind that all of this is being done with residential grade construction, which is to say a poured in place slab, um, like aged metal or wood framing. Um, very simple. Uh, uh, and familiar modes of construction that can be uh, accommodated by most uh, good contractors in the, in the area. So the idea of a rain screen quite often runs at odds with that level of technology. However, um, as some of you who may be familiar with our work know, in projects that we've completed recently, we found uh, three other ways to introduce rain screen technologies into residential construction and had great success with it. 
um, completed projects that, that uh, um, I think led us to understand more about the way that a rain stream works. Simultaneously, we were working with notions of the landscape, trying to figure out what the initial steps might be to establish a kind of a ground um, that, uh, that uh, accommodates the flow of water um, and the capturing of water to create different environments for different intensities of planting. Uh, the lower left-hand boards show, let's say, three levels of planting, an upper story, an intermediate story, and a ground story. Um, the way in which we manage water, and of course, if any of you have traveled around uh, the, the periphery around Houston and, and seen any of the farmland, you find what are referred to by the locals as tanks. This is basically a hole in the ground that all the water flows into. It's filled with uh, fertilizer, animal waste, you know, you name it. It's actually a pretty unpleasant component of, of most rural landscapes, but necessary. Um, we decided to take a very different approach and develop a series of, of, um, of edges that I think are probably more apparent, or at least you can see in part, um, along a ridge on the site, um, capturing the flow of water um, and, uh, and, and developing environments where um, plant structure could be propagated. Um, the original garden has 80-foot trees. They were all planted by the owner. Um, they've grown to an incredible uh, degree of maturity and density, and so the, the ambitions for the project were, were more or less there. So I think that I guess the, the point that I'm trying to make with this project uh, was that uh, it's much like the kinds of projects that we produce in school, in the sense that we're not, we're not geared to ask the kinds of questions through construction phases, except for in perhaps the Rice Building Workshop. Um, but outside of that, for the, most, for the most part, studios address the kinds of issues that can be addressed in the context of drawing, um, some degree of research, modeling. And I think that, that what, what made the, the better project successful in the studio when I taught it a year ago, as well as I think the things that were the most convincing uh, about this project to the, the client, was this interaction between the proclamations, which were very ambitious and they, I think that they established a kind of a ground that everyone could discuss um, and the examinations which occurred at a very different scale for a very different set of purposes, um, but brought a different level of resolution to the project. Thanks. So bumping so, up the course yeah, yeah. studio time is, is one when you have four people trying to speak in an hour, but uh, we, we can maybe hold people here for a little bit longer and take a few questions. Um, uh, question. I'm really happy with this studio, um, especially in regards to uh, I experienced last year that it's really incorporating a lot of um, things that I was hoping to get to the comprehensive studio from um, different systems that are involved in um, creating a building. I, I know from my building itself it's really benefited from the structural and um, working with fraud and things like that to really develop my building. Um, within the studios, I have a couple questions. Like you, we talked about a lot of, you know, one studio kind of pulled out and another kind of learning, always sharing our, our work with others. Um, within the thematics of, you know, software, formwork, groundwork, and framework, what always stood out for me was groundwork because um, these three studios want to have like a, an architectural technique or an operation of some sort, while wood is more like a thematic within architecture. So my first question is, how does that kind of fit in within the overall scope of totalization? And then the second question is, um, I saw a lot of overlap between uh, my studio, Troy's, and Wong's studio, and MVP, and the other you know, facades. I never saw a lot of overlap with Kennedy's um, idea for uh, using the market force. And I even had a conversation with Mark Miller, sorry, sorry. Um, with the front, talking about my like, facade system and, um, something came up, you know, like, this costs a lot more money, you know, if you want to work a new technique. And my response to him was, you know, I have, I have an extravagant budget. I don't have to worry about it too much, so if I can try a, little, a couple new things out. Um, I almost kind of want to be pushed a little bit more, you know, can I, do I have only like a, you know, a $10 million budget? That's going to really attract the kind of preparation I'm using my facade, kind of materials are used. So my questions are, like, what kind of overlap do you see between um, candidates who do with the other three? How does the void studio fit in with the other three? Well, I think uh, just to address the just to address the question of the void type, um, from the very beginning, I think that we were all concerned, um, 
Sarah, uh, as well as each of the, the four of us teaching the comprehensive studio. Um,